two flying wings, plus an Air, Air Force Reserve. No, 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 that's straight to the wing. So this is it guys, the completion of our story. We're here with the B-47 Stratojet. so we can protect the inside of the aircraft. But you know that basically the black top which has been that way. It's pretty much authentic painting scheme. And the white, you know, typically you have the white underneath. It's kind of like you're mimicking a cloud up above. Uh -huh. You're looking up. Sort of qualified. Okay. Sort of, but I always thought it was the weirdest. I always thought that was the dumbest paint scheme. Okay. You know, if you're trying to hide a plane, that was okay in World War One when these planes were parked out on grassy fields. But when you're on a tarmac, what stands out?
What do you think, bird unit? <laughs> I was waiting for directions from the director. But I am uh, uh, shocked that it's it's real. <laughs> <laughs> It's the last, one of the last remaining relics of your father. Mm. Putting you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> Did you touch it? Yeah. See if you touch it, you might download a message. That's awesome. Very cool. It says that it was given to the military in October of 51. That was before Frank's flight. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And his flight, last flight, was in 55. So it was in test mode for four years. This is, you know, the KC-135 is built by Boeing uh, under specs by the Air Force because they said we need a jet plane that can go as fast as the B-29 or the, I'm sorry, the B-47 because of those, you know, those jet engines, it couldn't slow down very, very much. And so they went to Boeing and said, build us a tanker to be able to go as fast as the B-47 because what we did we had this plane over here that's called originally it was a b-29 and a b-29 was a bomber's uh, it was the most advanced bomber we had at the towards the end of world war ii and uh, they converted it into a tanker and the problem is with those four props it couldn't go fast enough for the b-47 so they added those little outboard engines they looked like drop oh yeah engine. well those are little jet engines on the outside. <laughs> and that gave it about 20 miles an hour faster all right but um, it helped for the, B, for the B-47, but the B-47, even to slow down to get gas out of that, it had to get what's called close to what's called minimum controllable airspeed. Minimum controllable is the slowest you can fly before falling out of the sky <laughs> going into stall. And so that's how dangerous it was to aerial refuel. Now, if you go to the prop to prop, it wasn't a problem, but for these jets, because in the buff, they had to lower their landing gear and the flaps and, you know, all this drag to slow it down enough for that plane to give it fuel. So it was kind of a, 
a big problem. So that's why they went to um, the KC-135 to be able to refuel it. Mm. And they show that like in that movie, Strategic Air Command, they're showing the KC-135 on a refueling. Yeah, they show that. You know, and I think that's one where it shows where the fuel line ruptured inside the plane or something and caused a fuel leak inside the plane. Um, I, th that's right? on a different plane though. I think it's the B, uh, I can't think of oh, it, but yeah, it's a- Oh yeah, the B-36. Yeah. Yeah, okay. It's so that, that big one. Job, so this plane was good for that. You know, it could do, do that with the B-36, but then eventually the B-36, they put jet engines on it. But the originals had, it actually had this very engine. You might have saw that engine in our, in the Dice Memorial Center, the little museum building. So that's, you know, that's the exemplar of what this engine is. And they had that on the B-47, or the B-38 also, B-36 also. But they were rear pushing then they eventually converted it to jet engines. Or they added jet engines on it to make the difference. But yeah, so that's sort of the story there. Huh. That's neat. This thing has a real unique look to it. Yes, sir. Well, the original part was just up there, and then when they converted it to a cargo bomber plane or tanker, you know, they had this big belly underneath. And so part of it's cargo up in the front part, and then the back part is for fuel tank. Stuff like that, and then there's a boom operator in the back. This is like the K. You look at the KC-10s. Uh, the, the boom operator is sitting in a seat, and that's the way this one is also. The back part, he's actually sitting down, whereas on the KC-135s, they're laying down. Kind of deal. Like I said, it's easier to sit up. Uh -huh. right, so here's your B-17. Yeah, my grandpa Paul flew this yes, one. Sir called the Flying Fortress. Do you by chance know what the wing was or group that he was with? Mm, I haven't got that far yet, but okay. I might find out later. Initially, they had to get 25 and then they bumped up the That crew, they got up to 25 and then that's the name of the car the crew. And uh, until they got into the war and they found out that, you know, with all that gunpowder, you still had fighters who were able to come in and shoot you down. Mm. And it did nothing for the flak. <laughs> so, yeah, I heard something like that if they flew 10 or 15 missions, they got to retire because they weren't expected to make that many missions. Uh, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> no. Initially, they had to go 25, and then they bumped it up to 35. Oh. Like, you've heard about the story of the Memphis Bell. That crew, they got up to 25, and then that's when they retired the crew. Mm. Not necessarily the plane, per se, but you know, they brought the plane back for the doing the dog and pony show stuff, right? But that crew, yeah, once they got their 25 missions, okay? But that crew, yeah, once they got their 25 missions, then they could go home. And then after a while, and at that time, it was pretty bad odds. Your survivor, maybe 11. You know, basically the average crew lasted 10 to 11 flights, and then that was it. So that was kind of a godsend for them to be hit 30, yeah. 25 marker. And then, um, and, and then they, after a while, we, we had fighters escorting, then they could go longer. You know, there was a better longevity. And so they bumped it up to 35. And then occasionally guys were offered after the 35, they said, well, we want to keep flying. We'll send you back to the States, take r and for about a month or two, and then come back and start all over again. Well, we'll bump you up to 50, 50 flights or oh. something, right? Had another 15 to oh, yeah. 35. So there's a few that did that. A lot of them, they were done. I mean, they, you know, it was very terrifying. And, you know, because once they take off, you know, from England, they cross the English Channel, they're going through flat, and they're going through fighters going to come. And because they, I mean, the Germans, they had, you know, fighter bases all over France and Belgium and North, Netherlands and, of course, Germany. And so they see you coming, they know you're coming. So they wait the last, then they go up after you, attack you, go back and they refuel, gas up, move more, more bullets, and then do it all over again. On your way back. On your way back, you might be traveling 50 miles over that. I mean, it was very, it didn't take long to get a lot. But this, this particular model was never shot. So they never saw something new. Same thing for this guy too. Now the dog, 
you don't have any indication of the kind of thing. Okay, was a nice one on the D-47 and how thin it was. Yeah, it's pretty fair. It's not very... They took the original bombers and they put this stuff and then, you know, took it back to the factory and added this. And then later on, uh, they just, the factory was making them straight like this, coming out of the factory like this. And my understanding, that's what this model is. It came out of the factory like this. It wasn't that's like magic. Yeah. Like I say, he just flies it down very carefully. He's got those little ailerons up there that can you know, float, float it down. And extends the tube down at the right distance, and then it locks on to whatever the receptacle is. It actually locks into the receptacle, so you're from that point you're almost like you're tugging the plane along. And then when you're done, shut off the fuel, then they release the latch. But you can see, it's kind of hard to see up inside there, but he's, you know, he has a seat that he's actually sitting. Yeah, in. I can you know, see so like some dials. Yeah. So this in the KC97 or KC10. Uh, they have the guy sitting in a, in a chair, whereas in the, if you look at the KC-135, they're laying down in the back end. <laughs> and so sure enough, we had the story of this 329 at crash. And uh, so I came down here, I took a photograph of this plane, and sent it down, and then they, this, this gentleman's daughter-in-law, you know, superimposed the, the tail moment of that his plane on the tail. Actually, my grandpa Paul wrote a book about his time flying the C-130 in the Vietnam era. Okay. He wrote a whole uh, book about it. Cool. What's the name of the book? You know? C-130. C-130. It's, it's not published anywhere as far as I know. It's... Uh, we only have a few copies of it in the family, but um, I'm going to make another documentary about that after I finish this one about my grandpa Frank. I have not ever fished before. You know, both of my dad all the time. What are you doing? But he doesn't really But if you're interested in that kind of stuff, I, I definitely would share it with you. That would be sweet. Yes, sir. Take up. Could you do it? Could you do it? Could you do Commission and I think it was October, November of 
It has a Purple Heart inside. It comes from one of its missions. It was uh, flying over the Ho Chi Minh. They were popping flares over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And they started receiving the rest of fire, blew out one of the engines, and caused a fire. And so the flight engineer went out to put out the fire. He was here, so he got some fire burns. So he's the only one that was injured on this, this sortie. Uh, the pilots were able to safely land the airplane back on the, at its base. And they repaired. It took about six months, and it was back operational like normal. Patched up all the hmm. holes, and it was good as, good, good as new. And um, anyway, when he took his purple heart, he went and donated to the plane. Not grateful for the pilots, but grateful for the plane ah. for saving his life. Yeah. Because it's just the hardiness of it. That's, this is another testament, like I was saying, talking about the B-17. It, this plane could take a lot of good damage. Take a beating. Take a good beating. It's still very, that's why it's called the Hercules. It carries a lot of payload where they can push cargo out the back end or humans out the side or even humans out the back end. And I can show you that kind of stuff inside. We have some uh, cots, litters that are attached on the inside, so you can we can so you can demonstrate how you know they could carry wounded personnel out of a bat battle zone area. Kind of cool. Yeah, my grandpa had a similar story in his book about it, the Quezon battle, and one. Mr. Mom's name, Mr. Roberta. Miss Roberta. Miss Roberta. You're welcome to come over. You can go inside. <laughs> Um, yeah, he would be popping smoke in the Quezon battle, and he won a medal for that because he spotted a munitions dump and then flew around, flew around, and had to call in some Navy guys, I okay. guess, were the closest right. guys, and they said, yeah. well, we don't work for you, and he said, well, I outrank you, so you do. Yeah. And they they came and blew up the munitions dump, and it was a big win for that battle yes, of Quezon. Yes, sir. Well, you saw that as we were coming up. On the other side of this black plane, you see the, the pusher jet, push-pull jet. Got the engine in front and in the back. That's called an OV-10, okay? And that's what those spotter planes, that's what their job is. And they had these rocket, you see these rocket pods on the outside of the wings, and they would shoot these phosphorus rocket pods to mark the sights. You know, so that's that's what that plane is. Huh. That's what they would use to go around. There's a famous movie called Bat 2-1. Do you ever see that movie, mm -hmm. Bat 2-1? You know, so that's, that's what that plane is. Huh? That's what they would use to go around. There's a famous movie called Bat 2-1. Do you ever see that movie, Bat 2-1? It involves that Walter Nichols is over there filming that plane. This is uh, what's called an RB-66. They also had a version called EB-66. And it was uh, jamming. They, would, they packed a bunch of jamming and put in the bomb bag. Sure. Yeah, well, okay. Way before they had to do visual locations. And then the little radio could last maybe about three hours, tops. And that was about it. Okay. Should I go in sure. first? Yeah, well, I'll go ahead. Okay. We just kind of follow. Go ahead and go up the flight deck. Your mom can come too. She wants to. I think she will. So here's the flight deck. Okay, <laughs> so right now, what we have here, we have what's called the J model, which is a little bit larger. Uh, I mean, it's a basic, same basic frame. It's a stretch body, and there they they have a glass. Uh, what's called a glass cockpit. So you have glass dials, basically like a, a big iPad or like 18 inch, you know, black flat screen TV. And that's what's all these, instead of all these individual dials, they have these flat screens to do that. Still, <laughs> same gadgets, same buttons and all. Could I sit in the this seat? Yes, you're welcome to sit in the seat. Awesome. You go be the pilot. This is so cool. You're welcome to come up, be the pilot, co-pilot or the flight engineer or the navigator. Are these the original seats too? Yes, sir. And wow. like you say, they got refurbished. They're starting to get a little wear and tear because of the sun beaming on it. Because we kind of, instead of painting the windows black, we're keeping it so you can still see it. Could they fly with a window open like this? Oh, no, sir. Oh. It's only open during taxiing, when they're taxiing on the ground. You don't, you don't have windows open. Because I had wondered how he was able to spot that munitions dump, but I guess maybe he could have seen down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's these nice windows here on the side. Now, the new version is just one little bit bigger window instead of the two, two panel ones, but 
Yeah, they have a lot of, I mean, you look at the little window on, you know, on the other side of your dash there. So there's lots of windows to be able to look out. This, they were really thinking good when they put this thing together. Lots of visual. Where's the radio? Like if, if I was going to make the a... The radio's all down here in this area. If I was going to make here. a call to the crew in the back. Radio this stuff. And I would just speak into yes, this. Because huh. you know your crew, you normally your microphones for your play inside the plane, they're kind of what called hot mics. So you just talk, you're free talking, and it just transmits inside. But if you want to talk outside, you normally would push a button, like that little red button on the steering wheel, mm -hmm. on the yoke. You'd push the button and then that would open up the outside radios. So you need to talk like a lot of times you're in formation with other planes, very seldom they're out there flying by themselves. So you want to be able to talk to those guys, short distance stuff, or if you need to talk to air traffic control, long distance, whatever, you can do that. He was known for making puns over the radio yeah. and kind of annoying his crewmates, but he was the pilot. <laughs> That's awesome. Here's the plaque about talking about this plane if you want to get a hook and take a photograph of that too. This is the navigator seat? This is the navigator seat, yes sir. This is so cool. Yes sir. Wouldn't let it be the charge on Oh no sir. Oh. It's only open during taxiing. When we're taxiing on the ground. You don't, you don't have windows open. Because I had wondered how he was able to spot that munitions dump. But I guess maybe he could have seen down. Yes sir. Yes sir. We got these nice windows here on the side. Now the new version is just one little bit bigger window instead of the two one two panel ones. But yeah, they have a lot of. I mean, you look at the little window on, you know, on the other side of your dash there. So there's lots of windows to be able to look out. Guess you, they were really thinking good when they put this thing together. Lots of visuals. Where's the radio? Like if if I was gonna make. Okay, the radio's all down here in this area. If I was going right to make here. a call to the crew in the back, right here, this stuff, and I would just speak into this, because yes, huh. you would your crew, you normally your microphones for your plane inside the plane, they're kind of what called hot mics, so you just talk, you're free talking, it just transmits inside. But if you want to talk outside, you normally you'd push a button like that little red button on the steering wheel, mm -hmm. on the yoke, you'd push the button, and then that would open up the outside radios. So you need to talk like a lot of times you're in formation with other planes. Very seldom they're out there flying by themselves. So you want to be able to talk to those guys, short distance stuff, or if you need to talk to air traffic control, long distance, whatever, you can do that. He was known for making puns over the radio. Yeah. And kind of annoying his crewmates. But he was the pilot. <laughs> yeah, they kind of get through what they want to do. That's awesome. Yes, sir. So here's the plaque about talking about this plane if you want to get a hook and take a photograph of that too. This is the navigator seat. This is the navigator seat. Uh -huh. this, this is so cool. Yes, sir. Wouldn't mother get a charge out of this? Yeah. Good stuff. She grew up an Air Force brat, but didn't get to see much of this, I don't think. Yeah. And then, since as a historian, I've been total of eight countries that I've lived in, courtesy the United States Air Force. So, pretty sweet. I came to it late. I was 15. Yes, ma'am. When I became one. Okay. I'm slightly resentful. Yeah. <laughs> You gotta move and at least say goodbye to your friends. Yeah. See, when you're a little kid, it's not that big a deal. We were, I was fortunate, my dad retired and I was, I guess I was 12 by the time he retired. So I didn't, we just moved one time to San Antonio and that was it. Well, we moved a couple of times in San Antonio, but stayed in the same school district, same cluster of kids, right? So it wasn't that big a deal for me, but um, my wife, she, her dad was a full regret.
there right after the war. My dad's job, when he was with the USAID, United States Air Force Europe, uh -huh. he was at their headquarters, and his job was to set up the postal system, the APO system in uh -huh. Europe. Oh. Yes. So he went everywhere. Oh, yeah. And he saw everything. And it was way, way cool for him. And, uh, but yeah, that was his job. It lasts forever. But this is a plaque that they made for uh, a B-47 that crashed up in Montana. And it's kind of cute that, you know, Strategic Air Command has always had what's called a disinformation campaign, where they intentionally give you false information. And so it's kind of cute because on our plaque out here, they did the same thing. Six clustered around America, and one of them was here. And uh, so this is the typical layout there, about 180 feet underground. Uh, and then the missile would be brought up and launched at ground level. He had a command and control center over here, you know, connected by a tunnel, and had these huge metal steel doors to block them all. Shoot me an email. I'll try to find a, a much better quality version of that one. Because it seems like you're the senior one in charge here. Well. No offense to Walter, he's Navy. Uh, I'm Air Force, he's Navy. Oh, uh, yeah.